the emergency department. Um, I've been in the emergency department over there for about 17 years and I've been the nurse educator there for about three years. Um, most of everything I've done is pediatrics um, and I'm just excited that I can reach out and talk to all of everybody here. Um, I think it's a mixture of EMS and everybody else, but thanks for coming. Um, I'm just going to go over some pediatric tips. It was really hard to come up with a topic for this because there's so many different things that are pediatrics. And I started out by asking um, different providers and different EMTs that came into the department what they wanted me to talk about or what they thought would be relevant for me to talk about. And I got a slew of different answers from airway to diabetes to everything. So I tried to incorporate all different ones in here and touch on a little bit of everything, but most everything comes back to airway with pediatrics. Um, and so I tied it all back into airway. But please, if you have questions, shout them out. It's really hard to lecture to a whole bunch to a black screen. So um, shout out questions, ask questions, um, and there'll be a time for questions at the end too, um, if you have any. So I'm gonna share my screen. So all of my pediatric pearls. So the thing to remember about pediatrics is that they aren't just little adults. There's a lot of things that are different between an adult and a pediatric patient, um, especially their airway. Uh, kids, um, their, their airways are really tiny, their heads are really big, and their bodies are really small, and they're really disproportionate, um, and they, they like to put everything in their mouth, so it, it can be very difficult when you're trying to assess why that they're there. Um, and a pediatric patient's airway is the size of their little finger. So if you ever have a patient, you're trying to figure it out to like what's going on with them, and if you have to intubate them or you're worried about the airway, just remember that the size of their airway is the size of their little finger. It's tiny. It's so tiny. They have these big heads. They like to put things in their mouth. They like to choke or they don't like to choke, but they end up choking. So there's a lot of different things about their airway that have to come into play. They have these large tongues. And so if they're seizing, you have to remember, you know, to tilt their head back. And everything with a pediatric patient comes in, in intervention comes first. Um, it's very, uh, it's very different from an adult patient. Whereas if you know their pulse ox drops, you can just throw some oxygen on them. Or if you um, sit them up a little bit. Whereas a pediatric patient, they have those big tongues and little airways, and so you have to move them around and keep their airways open in order for any of your interventions to work. Um, respiratory is one of our biggest reasons why pediatric patients seek care. We have more respiratory complaints come into our emergency room than any other complaint combined. Um, a lot of the respiratory complaints are combined with a lot of different things. They can be fever or cough or um, it, a lot of secretions. You know, we have bronchiolitis, so our bronchiolitis season, they come in and they just, all the little, little people are coming and they're working really hard to breathe. So it's really hard to decipher between what respiratory component they're coming in with. And then another uh, portion of pediatrics is everything comes, once again, ties back in their airway, but almost over 90% of our unexpected pediatric codes come in due to airway issues. Um, they usually have these wonderfully healthy hearts and they beat really fast and they want to be healthy. They want to stay going and something happens respiratory, whether it is a respiratory issue or they cut off their airway, something happened and therefore their heart stopped. So it's all about getting their respiratory drive back and remembering that their airway is so small that everything that they do revolves around this little airway. Um, so we're gonna go through a couple of calls. I have to move this over, a couple of calls. Yes, who has a question? Someone has a hand raised. No, okay. Um, I don't know this. So this is um, a call that came in. So this is a one-year-old with difficulty breathing. When EMS arrived, I can't move this. When EMS arrived, uh, she was being held by her parents. She appeared lethargic. She wasn't moving much. She was tachypnic with increased work, work of breathing. She had high pitch strider at rest and shallow respirations. She had mild cyanosis to her lips. 
Um, her vital signs were she had a, uh, no temperature. She was 97.4. Her heart rate was 154. Her respiratory rate was 64. Her blood pressure was 75 over 43 with a pulse ox of 84%. So that's what you heard when you when you arrived. Um, she had mild moderate retractions. She was nasal flaring, but she had strong central pulses. She was lethargic, but she withdrew to pain um, to tactile stimulation. So what are you going to do when you get there? So her airways, obviously, you know she's having difficulty breathing. So rescue put a non breather on her. They repositioned her, and they gave her or they considered giving her a racemic epinephrine. Um, and they died or they realized that she had croup. So a lot of our population comes in and there's a um, difference between croup and asthma. Um, so this patient had croup. So croup, if you think about a small patient, especially uh, somebody who is under eight years of age, their airway isn't shaped like an adult. So their airway isn't up and down. It's more narrow right above the epiglottis. So it narrows down and they get a virus that virus causes swelling, and therefore uh, uh, what you hear is a barky cough. They have difficulty breathing, they have snoring respirations, and they have, or they could have strider. And we worry about strider because if that swelling in that airway gets so closed, they can't even fit air through it, and it makes that uh, noise because they're trying so hard to get air through there. So they get croup often, or sometimes kids get croup every time they get a virus, and it's just the swelling in their airway that just makes that noise. Our biggest concern with that noise is if, you, if they're working that hard to get a breath in, that we worry that they're going to spasm and their airway is going to close. So it's really important for these kids to um, stay as calm as possible, to stay with their mom and dad, to sit upright. Um, they, we recommend if they um, are at home to go outside, get some cool mist um, so the cold air will help decrease some of that swelling. Um, but it's a virus, so there's not much we can do other than wait it out um, and see how it goes. So a little bit different, but kind of similar, our, the second scenario is a 10-year-old who's coming in with uh, difficulty breathing. This patient was sitting up, was anxious, moderately distressed on arrival when EMS arrived, had pale skin and increased work of breathing. Her vital signs, she had a, a temperature of 98.4, a heart rate of 140, respiratory rate of 40, her blood pressure was 160, over 68 and a pulse ox of 86%. And that's what you heard when you listened to her. She had suprasternal and intercostal retractions, expiratory wheeze in the lower lobes, and she could only speak in two to three word sentences. So this was a lot different of an exam than the first one. So rescue sat her up. They set, let her sit with mom. They put a non-rebreather on her. Um, they gave, gave her nebulized albuterol. And then throughout the stay, it was a long ride. They ended up giving her corticor steroids. Yeah. And this is asthma. Um, it's, a lot of the times these patients present in very similar ways. So they have difficulty breathing, they have a really bad cough, um, they're difficulty getting their air in. Um, asthma is different than croup because it's a lower airway. It's when the bronchioles in the lungs are swollen, whereas croup is the upper airway. Um, and so it's sometimes very difficult to distinguish between the two. And so at Hasbro, we see a lot of um, the confusion between the two, whereas one comes in, they both come in coughing, they both come in with difficulty breathing, um, they uh, croup, you usually have a fever and you're miserable, but asthma, it can be uh, started with a virus as well. 
So it comes down to the difference between strider versus wheezing. So strider is that upper airway where it's closing and you get that beep, that squeaky sound. Um, strider, when you listen to their lungs, their lungs are usually clear. But if you listen up near their neck, you usually hear that loud squeaking noise. And that's um, one of the ways that we listen and distinguish between strider and wheeze. Whereas when you listen for a patient who has a lower airway or asthma, you listen to the lungs and you can actually hear that wheeze coming through um, and they're, you know, they're having difficulty getting air in, they're having difficulty getting air out. Um, patients, either way, they can be very distressed, but it's different um, parts of the lungs that are affected. So both, they should stay with their parents. Both, you should give them oxygen. Um, but with Strider, the racemic epinephrine is, works on the alpha and the beta receptors and um, opens them up. And so opens up their airway, decreases that swelling, and lets them take the air in. So therefore, we don't worry about their airway spasming and closing, um, and they get the air that we need. So throughout their hospital stay, we watch these patients, and we make sure that they don't rebound, that they don't need any more racemic epinephrine as they go. And we also give these patients steroids to help decrease or keep the swelling down so that it just doesn't keep coming up and re-swelling. Whereas asthma is a little bit harder to treat. We see asthma a lot in kids. It's the most common um, chronic childhood disease. We see these kids come in, uh, especially in New England, when the seasons change over and over again. It's cold in the morning, hot in the afternoon. You don't know which, which layer to wear. Um, and they have a lot of triggers. We have trees that bloom too early. Um, so they, there are a lot of triggers, especially in New England, that trigger our asthmatics. And they come in and they can be very sick. And so when um, rescue brings us brings them in, we try to get them back very quickly because the albuterol that rescue has given them wears off pretty quick. And so these patients need a lot of intervent interventions. We give them albuterol, 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 um, albuterol. Remember that pediatric patients, they have these cute little hearts and they're really healthy, or for the most part, they're really healthy and they want to keep eating. And so giving them albuterol their heart rate can go high, but their heart can withstand it. So we give a lot of albuterol to these kids knowing that their heart can withstand it. So we give a lot more albuterol than you would in say an adult patient. Um, so we're not afraid to give back-to-back -back albuterol or duonabs. We're not afraid to start them on continuous albuterol for a few hours because it's what they need to help decrease that inflammation and open up their airway. Um, and these kids also get steroids. Um, we can use mag sulfate to help open them up. So we use a lot of bronchodilators and um, smooth muscle relaxers to keep asthmatics open so that they can breathe. Um, but we see a lot of those, uh, a lot of these patients come in. And it's one of the most common um, patients that we see come in by rescue. And so sometimes you see your patients who come in with croup who are given albuterol, but the because their lungs are so uh, are healthy and they're not affected, the albuterol doesn't necessarily help them. It just makes their heart go a little bit quicker. Um, and they're already scared and having difficulty get, getting air in. Um, but racemic epinephrine that would actually help them both. So um, because it would help decrease the swelling in both uh, strider and with these. Any questions on those two? Okay, moving into our next one. So this is an MBA call that we did get, um, it, it, tying it right in with all the pearls in the um, uh, airway. So this was a patient who came in, he was a 21 month old. He was, um, a, a parent was driving. He was uh, restrained in his car seat. So it was a five point car seat. He was restrained properly, but the car seat itself wasn't restrained in the back of the car. It wasn't buckled in. So it was kind of just sitting in the back of the car. So when, um, I, when the, so the car that the, the parent was driving hit a tree. And when the um, rescue got there, the car seat was flipped on its side on the floor of the back seat. Um, the patient was awake, he was moaning, he was really pale, he was still restrained in his car seat, just on the floor. Uh, 
Um, so EMS picked up the car seat, they put it in the back on, on their stretcher, they transported him, they did, they were able to get a set of vital signs on the scene, nothing was super impressive, they were pretty much in the normalish range on scene, um, but they uh, kept him in his car seat, but they weren't able to put a collar on because of, he was so small, they didn't have a collar that size, he was only 21 months old and he was like, you know, like this big, he had a big head, little body, couldn't get that collar in there. Um, so he uh, was uh, 20 minute transport time to the hospital, they reported. On arrival, when he walked through the doors, his head was slumped over like this picture because of, you know, big head, little bodies. He was cyanotic and he was pulseless. So we took him right out of the car seat um, in the ED and we initiated CPR. Yeah, I don't know, I don't know what just happened. I don't know why it's going. Sorry. My PowerPoint's out of control. Okay, I think it's gonna work, okay. So what we got, the, when he came to the ED, we were able to reposition his airway. Um, once we took him out of the car seat, we repositioned the airway, we were able to intubate him. On the monitor, he was in a PEA arrest. Uh, we, with CPR, a whole bunch of epi, um, a lot of breathing through an intubated tube, we were able to get a, a pulses DAC and he was sinus Brady on the monitor. Um, so this patient, not that rescue could have ever known, but he had an atlanto-occipital dislocation, which means he was pretty much internally decapitated. Um, his head was dis dislocated um, and it cut off the oxygen supply when he became slumped over. And once you cut off the patient's airway, it puts them right into, pretty much right after, into cardiac arrest. And this was because that airway was occluded because it wasn't really attached anymore. And so his head just kind of slumped right over. Um, and so it brings up a bigger point. So this patient, he had, you know, a lot going on. He um, was very sick baseline. He had um, a lot of C-spine injuries. He had respiratory injuries. Um, but one of the things that just to not, or to think about when you're transporting a patient in who was in an MVC is that, yes, these patients have tiny little necks and you can't always get a C-collar on them. But just remember that their heads are really, really big and we don't want them to slump over. So using towel rolls and taping them, even though it's gonna make them cry and scream and it's gonna take a lot of time to get the tape around them is really important. Um, and so that way you can maintain C-spine precautions on patients because even though the car seat makes it a lot less likely for patients, for small patients who are properly restrained to be injured, it's still a huge possibility. So making sure that their um, airways are intact, making sure that their head is secured goes really far. Um, and, and it brings up another point of reassessing their airway. It is pediatric airways, um, it, they decompensate very quickly. Um, they go from breathing and they're really fine and they're compensating and compensating. And then all of a sudden pediatric patients are like, hey, I'm too tired. I'm just going to go to sleep and I'm not going to do it anymore um, because they just they get tired and they're all done. So these cute little hearts, they they beat and beat and beat and they keep up and they breathe really, really fast. And they uh, they use every muscle they have inside of their tiny little bodies to work, to breathe. Does somebody have a question? Oh, they, it, it takes to work to breathe and then they just kind of get tired on you. So reassessing their airway. So um, even if you don't have a pull socks that fits them um, or if they won't keep their pull socks on, um, it's, it, it, you just want to make sure that you're assessing it. Frank, do you have a question? I don't know, the, the hands raised. I didn't know if that meant you had a question. 
Um, so things to, when you are trying to get the, the pulse ox on, remember that you can put it on their fingers, you can put it on their toes, you can put it on their ear, you can put it across their forehead if you have this, the sticker versions, um, anywhere that will read. The forehead is a little bit less accurate, but you're, at least you're getting a reading so you can have an idea. Um, and it, it helps you, so it's right in the forefront so that you're, you're keeping an eye on them. Um, you're making sure that they're not, you know, slumping over at all. Because if you think of having this big head and this tiny little earway, all it takes is a little repositioning for that airway to become occluded and them not be able to get the air that they need. Um, and, and that happens very frequently in pediatrics. They become very distressed. Um, and it's just a simple maneuver of moving the airway or ch um, tilting their head back will get you the airway back and they'll work less. And if pediatric patients work less, they'll get tired less. Um, and it will be an easier ride for you guys. Questions on that case? The next one is a, the, the next call that I wanted to go over was um, a seven-year-old who we were called, um, rescue was called for um, by mom for having a fever, vomiting and difficulty breathing for three days. The reason why she was calling was not for that, but now the patient had developed neck pain. So when EMS showed up, the patient was laying on mom's lap, kind of looked pale, had cracked lips, um, was working really, really hard to breathe. The patient was breathing really fast, was pale, was answering questions appropriately, um, but looked really poopy. So an albuterol was given by EMS and off they came to us. So this is what our friend looked like when he arrived. Um, his vital signs, he had a temperature of 99. He had a heart rate of 160. He had a blood pressure of 116 over 73 with a respiratory rate of 32. Um, and he was 97% on Rumere. He was breathing really fast. He had pale skin, sunken eyes, cracked lips, and he was kind of laying there. So this patient, our patient that came to us um, was a little bit more awake, um, but Rescue had a normal breather on him. He was looking comfortable. But then we did his glucose. So when, we, when he came in, um, the nurse immediately recognized the fact that this appeared to her as Kussmaul breathing. And it's really hard to distinguish Kussmaul breathing from respiratory distress. Um, so it's so amazingly important to get that glucose in the truck if possible, because that will steer you in the direction. So kids, especially school-age kids, are, um, those, that's the age where they um, develop diabetes. Um, and you know, it's hereditary. It usually happens, it comes on after a virus. Sometimes the families will tell us that, hey, they had a cold and now they were getting better. I don't know what happened, but now they kind of look like this. Um, his came with cold symptoms. It's not uncommon for it to follow a cold or be around a cold. Um, our biggest concern with pediatric patients, especially the one that if you looked, um, he, was, he had no real reserve. He was skinny. They're little like skin and bones. So they get sick a lot faster. So with diabetes, their pancreas breaks. The pancreas isn't giving, releasing any insulin. So the sugar builds up inside of them. The sugar builds up inside of them and sucks everything in to try to, from their um, extracellular sucks it into the veins to try to offset how much sugar this poor patient has. Um, it just makes them pee a whole bunch and it makes them really dehydrated for a lot of different reasons. It makes their electrolytes completely out of whack, their potassium's out of whack, their sodium. Um, but the more that they the higher their sugar, the more their body is breaking down, um, it is sucking everything into the vein and breaking down fat and muscle to create energy for this little child. And the more the body is breaking down the muscle and the fat, the more lactic acid is being put in the blood causing them to be acidotic. So when we, when we see them, when they come to the hospital, they're usually kind of quiet. They're, sometimes they're altered a little bit. And it's just, it's because of they're so acidic, their blood is so acidic that they don't really know what to do with them. Um, and so, the, so it affects their brain. They become acidic and they get confused. 
So this patient, he was still answering questions, even though his glucose was 695, um, but he was very dehydrated. So we were able to um, give him a lot of fluids and offset some of that sugar that was um, in his bloodstream. So when you're, when you're trying to rule out diabetic ketoacidosis, which just means that your sugar's really high, you're peeing out ketones because your body's breaking everything down, and your blood is acidic because your pH is really low and your bicarb is really low. Um, it, 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 Kuzmo breathing and respiratory distress. So Kuzmo breathing is a way for the body to blow off the CO2. It's a way for the body to correct this acidosis that is happening inside of them. So as they're breathing off the CO2, it's their body's peep valve. It's, it's, it's the mechanism. And so we want to support it. Um, but it does sometimes look like respiratory distress. They're breathing fast, they're working to breathe, they're tired because they're, they're altered a little bit. And so from your point of view, it's really hard to, from a rescue's point of view, when you're only have them in the back of your truck for a small amount of time, you wanna make sure you're checking that sugar because that will help you deter either way of what you're gonna treat them with. Um, and if you do find that they have a, a high sugar, Fluids is the first thing that we give them. So we start with normal saline and we give them sugar to help bring them down. We treat pediatric um, DKA different than we treat adult DKA. So pediatric DKA, we, kind of, we treat it with a little bit of fluids. We don't want to give them too much because no one ever really knows if um, the, we don't want their sh bodies to shift the fluid too much. So we give them a bolus of fluids and then we switch over to an insulin drip in the hospital. So we, we go back and forth with the fluids and the insulin. We add all the electrolytes back into their fluids. Then we add a little bit of sugar if, if they get a little bit low, but it's the insulin that's gonna correct their acidosis. Without the insulin there, even if we just treat their sugars, their body is still breaking down that fat and so that's why the insulin is super important to break everything down um, and correct that acidosis. And it's a long process. These kids are in the hospital for a couple of days. They come in and they are um, given fluids and then we're, we monitor their, we're checking their sugars every hour and we're checking their electrolytes. Um, and we're looking for the fact that we don't want their sugar to drop too fast um, or we don't want their sugar to go up too fast. So we watch very carefully. But as far as when they first come in, when they're first off um, rescue, we, we want to make sure that we're giving them enough fluids, slowly correcting their acidosis with insulin, and slowly we'll see that small breathing go away. But um, in, in this case, the albuterol was given, and that um, albuterol, you know, so for small breathing, it has, it's not in the lungs. So patients with, with difficulty breathing um, look a little bit different. And so at giving albuterol to a patient who's too small breathing will only make their heart go hot, work harder. And they'll have even more difficulty, um, you know, because their heart's already working so hard. They're already trying to fight so hard and they're acidotic. So just making sure that we don't give um, albuterol for too small breathing. Um, and the biggest way to know is to check that sugar. Any questions on that call? Yes. Yes. Um, so what was causing the neck pain? That is a great question. I think that their body was just working so hard that the, she was tensing up and she was getting the neck pain. So kids, they roll in a ball and they get really, really tight and their muscles get really tight. And so it causes them to have like muscle spasms in their neck. And it was, um, no, we did check her neck out. It wasn't her neck. I think it was just the way she was holding herself. But that is what mom attached to and that's what called her caused her to call the rescue so we're really thankful for that because it got her to us and we started we were able to fix her um but kids they roll in balls they get really tight their muscles hurt um their body's breaking down the muscle and the fat and it was just that's what she was complaining of at that time all right thank you no problem. She also had a fever, and so she might have a viral process going on as well. Um, but it, it wasn't anything wrong with her neck. Any other questions? You guys are a quiet bunch. 
so this is a big call that we had. Um, so this is a 13 year old who the call came in as alter mental status. Um, rescue got a call that uh, the patient had fever, abdominal pain, vomiting and diarrhea for two days. Um, mom had been in contact with the pediatrician. Um, the pediatrician had ordered some Zofran and uh, the diarrhea and vomiting had persisted. Middle of the night, the patient woke up um, and was hallucinating, wasn't making any sense. Mom called rescue, um, but the patient kind of fell to the floor in front of her. So on arrival on the scene, um, rescue found a patient who was unconscious. Um, he had decreased respiratory effort while they were there. So paramedics on the scene intubated him. An end title was placed uh, with a reading of 10 to 12. They were able to get an IO in his left tibia and they got a glucose and it was 108. They were worried that that was causing his mental status. It was a longer transport as well. It was about a 20 to 25 minute transport. Um, they were bagging him the whole way up with re variable readings on end title the whole entire time they reported. On arrival to the ER, he was mottled and gray. Um, uh, he, we were, when the pulse was checked, he was pulseless with PEA on the monitor. CPR was initiated in the ED. Um, we were unable to obtain chest rise with an AMBU bag via their ET tube. Um, so that ET tube was pulled and one of our doctors reintubated. Uh, after multiple rounds of epinephrine, a uh, lot of CPR, a lot of epinephrine, we were able to get ROSC and weak pulses. Uh, he coded two more times in the ICU and unfortunately after the second time we were unable to resuscitate him. His autopsy revealed the cause of death was sepsis related to a perforated appendicitis. Um, which is, so kids get appendicitis, you know, it's, it's really common in pediatrics. They, um, it's one of our most common surgical issues. They come in and they have right lower quadrant pain. This patient, um, and usually it's a quick surgery that we take them, our doctors do daily and they take them to the OR, um, and they take out their appendix. But this patient, because he had, um, he didn't have the cardinal signs. He didn't say, you know, like my right lower quadrant hurts. Um, he, didn't, he didn't have those cardinal signs that led his parents or even his pediatrician to see. And COVID didn't help, you know, in the middle of COVID where you can't get to your pediatrician, it was a lot, it's a lot difficult. It's very difficult to have a phone conversation with your pediatrician and get to the end bargain. Um, but it brings up a great point between EMS um, and to intubate or to AMBO. Um, pediatric airways are so important. You know, we have, they have these little tiny airways and you guys are on the back of these car, these trucks and, and, and you're trying to intubate. Um, it's not common to intubate a pediatric patient. You have a bumpy rescue and it's really easy to go down the esophagus. So, and that's what happened with this patient. He was esophageally intubated. And so we weren't, they weren't able to get the oxygen to where they were, need, where it needed to go. Um, he, this patient was very septic. He had a lot of other things going on, um, but he, um, his airway was compromised in the rescue. And so a lot of, we get a lot of questions from EMS of whether, should we intubate, should we not intubate? And it's, and it's really hard to answer that question. Um, you know, we're from Rhode Island and it's really, really small. You're the, the, just the size wise of it. And there's usually a facility that's in pretty close proximity. And you guys have a hard job of trying to intubate these tiny little people in the back of a truck. Um, so sometimes it is just easier to bag a patient and not, um, and, and not intubate. As long as you're giving oxygen to the patient, that's exactly what they need. Um, and bagging them, you know, 20 times a minute as you're coming is just as successful as intubating a patient and hoping it's in the right place. Um, not that hoping you guys are very trained. It's just very difficult in the back of, an, of, uh, of a truck. 
Um, and it definitely, if you're intubating, we should you should use an end tidal capnography. So it's, um, everybody has a little bit different. So in the hospital, we use a couple of different things. We um, we use a color metric, which you to put on that when you're after you intubate, you bag a couple of times and you see if it changes color. Um, that's a like, you know, it's not a bad indicator, but end tidal is, is a really great indicator as long as you're right in the range. So a normal end tidal for a pediatric patient is just like an adult, it's supposed to be between 35 and 45, and it measures the partial pressure of carbon dioxide during expiration. So it lets you know if when you're ex exhaling the CO2 in there, and it gives you a really good indicator um, of if your tube is in the right place. Um, in the hospital, we'll also grab an x-ray as well, but you guys don't have an x-ray in the back of your truck. So just making sure that if you, if you do intubate, um, you, that you have your end title on and that you're making sure that the numbers are exactly where they are. If you're noticing that your numbers are lower, if you're noticing that your numbers aren't where they're supposed to, it's a good indicator that your tube's probably not where it's supposed to be. Um, and if you're unsure or if you're uncomfortable, we're just as happy if you, you come in bagging a patient with a good, a good seal and you're bagging, as long as the air is getting to the lungs, we're okay with that. So never think where anybody is ever going to be like, oh, you didn't even try to intubate because that is not the case. Um, pediatric airways are really hard. The, um, it, it's something that Uh, it, it's, 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 it's something that I know you guys are trained in, but if you don't use it often, um, you, it's, it's a skill that you don't necessarily keep. Jill King LMA was attempted. I'm just reading the comment. Um, so there was no mention of a King or an LMA. Um, I don't know why they chose to jump right to an ET tube, but that's a great point where if you have an LMA, those are um, great adjuncts, um, an NPA. I think that from the, from the rescue's call and from the rescue's point of view, sorry, the question was, is that, was there any mention of a, of, um, a King or an LMA um, or an NPA, OPA, or why jump right to an ET tube? Um, so I, I feel that, so the call that we got was that rescue was very worried about this airway um, and that the patient was uh, borderline conscious. They were, um, by the time they got there, he was not breathing well. He was taking, he was um, shallow respirations. He wasn't ventilating well. So they didn't feel that the drive, because it was like a 20, 25 minute drive, that they would be able to manage this airway. So that is why they chose to intubate. Um, I don't know why an LMA wasn't attempted. I know that LMAs are a great adjunct, an OPA or an NPA. We see a lot of patients who come in, especially after a seizure, having an OPA or an NPA, um, but uh, I, I don't know why. But definitely if you have those in your truck, those are great adjuncts as well. Um, so, just remembering that even if a patient who just just remembering that the airways are difficult. We know pediatric airways are difficult, but they are the most important part of caring for a pediatric patient. Um, and so if you are unsure about if your airway is in the right spot um, or if you're not getting an end title that is between 35 and 45, we would just um, at, I would just say just keep bagging the patient and don't worry about trying to intubate the patient. Um, so this patient who came in, he was not intubated in the correct place. So he went a very long ride without getting the oxygen that uh, he was supposed to. A lot of other things were going on with him. Uh, we tried very hard to fluid resuscitate him. We gave him fluids and fluids and fluids because he was septic on top of having a poor airway. Um, so he had a, a lot going on and he had a rough road, um, but just from Rescue's point of view, I would make sure that um, starting fluids as well. Um, no, he would have his heart rate was really high when they when they first got there. Um, he had been sick for a while. Um, starting an IV and giving fluids is always super helpful, and just bagging the patient on the way in. Any questions on that case other than the LMA?
don't know why I keep doing this. Um, so in conclusion, the biggest, um, the biggest reason I want to, you know, bring up airways is because of how small and how pliable they are. The, just remembering that a pediatric airway is the size of their little finger um, is a really great indicator of how easy it is for an airway to be occluded. We see patients who come in who swallowed a peach pit and they can just barely get air around. Um, or if they come in and they you know, swallowed something else or they are um, they have bronchiolitis and they have a lot of secretions and they can't, they're having a difficulty difficult time breathing, they, um, uh, their airway is just really small. So we have to do, always do an intervention, whether it's to tilt their head back, whether it's to suction their nares, um, keep them upright. And kids are scared of us. They're so scared of us. And so even, I mean, you guys are wonderful and you, you pick them up and you love them, but keeping them close to their parents and trying to fit another parent on the back of that rescue, I know it's really hard, will decrease their anxiety and it will make their um, breathing a little bit better because they won't be as scared. Um, so just remember that. And it's really hard. It's really hard to have a parent in the back of the rescue. And it's really, it's one is a tight fit too. They, um, it's, it's, a lot when you have someone else there, but it will it will help your practice in the long run. Um, and remembering that airways are the reason why kid, reasons why kids seek medical attention the most, um, and it's the most common cause of, common cause of pediatric death. Um, other airway issues that we see a lot are you know seizures. So when a patient comes in and they they had a febrile seizure and they um, are having difficulty breathing and they're or they're not really breathing the way they're supposed to, giving them oxygen and using that NPA or OPA is really really valuable. It helps keep their humongous tongue down so it doesn't block that airway. Um, so remembering their anatomy is, anatomy is super important. Tilt that head back keep their tongues down, use your OPA, use your MPA, um, put oxygen on them. Oxygen doesn't hurt because most of the time kids have these healthy little hearts. They can handle the oxygen. So if you don't know what else is going on, give them a little oxygen. Um, keep them upright, uh, keep them with their parents and just remember to reassess their airway. It's going to change. They're going to change really fast. They're like little booger factories. So if they're coming in with asthma or they're coming in with croup, um, their airway can swell up very fast or it can become uh, with, filled with boogers really fast. So you wanna make sure that you're just keeping an eye on it, um, especially if you have a longer ride or even if they're just kind of slumped over or sleeping. So if your patient is sleeping, just keep an eye on them in the back of your truck because their, their um, presentation can change really quickly. You want to make sure that you don't have their airway occluded because in a car seat, it's really easy for their head to go down and block off that airway. So taping it up, and that's what we do in the hospital sometimes is just simply putting a piece of tape around or taking them out of the car seat, which is really hard for you guys. And I know you leave them in the car seat and that's okay. Um, just remember to keep monitoring it because you don't want something to happen and they're their um, airway to become blocked when we could have avoided that. Um, and just keep an eye on them. Um, it, it's, it's very difficult to decipher between croup and asthma and bronchiolitis and all the different sounds. And so remembering that, you know, listening to the neck for croup is really valuable because their lungs will be clear and, and listening to their lungs for asthma because their lungs will be really noisy and loud. And bronchiolitis, they're just, loud everywhere. Um, but as long as you maintain their airway, keep them sitting up and open, it goes really far and um, it, it protects their airway and keeps them working less. And the less they have to work, the, the happier they'll be and the um, better they'll make it to the ER and their, their airway will stay open. Questions, thoughts? I did have one question about um, you, just their head position. You said tilting yeah. their head back. Is it, is it, I assume it's not exactly like an adult where you almost you're cranking their head back almost as far as you can go to try to open that airway. Is there like a, a, a specific position that's best, I feel, uh, with the pediatric population? 
Um, so you can, so as long as you're not worried about an injury, you can push their, their monstrous heads. Remember these really had, they go back very easily. So if you're on a flat surface, you can just tilt their head up just like you would an adult. Their, their necks are smaller, so you don't have to crank them as much. You just want to move their head, tilt their head up enough that you can see they have all these cute little rolls and they have all this fat and it's all slimy. And you just want to lift it up enough so that you can see their airway. And you'll notice almost immediately that the noises will decrease, the snoring will decrease, um, that they'll, the retractions that you see when they're breathing will decrease. You'll almost immediately notice that just by lifting up their head a little bit so that they're not like, makes them less distressed. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Is a uh, hypoglycemia a common condition also? The opposite of hypo? So, so hypoglycemia is really common in pediatrics. It is, um, especially for our younger population, they become hypoglycemic for a lot of different reasons. When they're very little, like infants, um, they, any virus or um, any, you know, diff if they're not eating and drinking, if they are, um, the virus vomiting, they can become hypoglycemic very quickly. And you'll notice that they'll be somnolent, they'll be quiet, they'll be a lot sleepier than normal. Um, they, they'll they wake up to sternal rubs, but they'll just be, the parents will come in and they'll complain of a lot, that, that they're just a lot sleepier. Um, but yes, we see hypoglycemia because uh, oh, very often um, kids, they're, they're stubborn. Kids are super stubborn. So if they have a virus, they keep their mouth closed. They're not going to eat. Um, you and I know that you have to take sips um, to stay hydrated. So we can make ourselves, even if we feel like crap, an adult will be like, okay, I have to take a couple of sips of this so that I don't feel like crap. Um, but kids, like two-year-olds are relentless. They're like, nope, I'm keeping my mouth shut. I'm not going to do it. And therefore, they're having vomiting. They're having diarrhea. They're not eating. They're not drinking. The parents aren't able to get anything in them. And their sugars drop pretty quickly. Um, and then they'll just come in and they'll be pale and they'll be um, quiet. Um, and so we would give them sugar, sugar back in the fluids we give them to try to correct that. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions or things you want me to go over? I didn't know how many questions there were going to be. I didn't know how long I should, I should make it. No other questions? Well, you guys can always reach out or email me if you guys have any pediatric questions. There's so many things with pediatric patients. I didn't want to overwhelm everything all at once. Um, and uh, I started with, or I, I went over airways today just because of how important they are and how everything um, pediatrics does is revolves around, well, what is their airway? And how everything that even a gastro bug can lead into airway issues. So every time that in, in Hasbro or every time you're in the back of the truck and you're, you're trying to figure out what's going on, it's good to just start with, you know, okay, so how making sure the airway is okay. And then what sounds are you listening to? Is it a croupy sound, which is strider? And then we're worried about that airway closing or um, is it asthma, is it lower? So we break it down in, in PALS and in, in pediatrics to exactly where the noise is coming from to how to treat it. Uh, do you mind just talking a little bit about epiglottitis and then maybe like a, a common cardiac issue? Sure. Um, yeah. So 
epiglottitis is less common in pediatrics uh, now because of vaccines. So we really, you know, push vaccines. We're really hopeful for that. Um, but kids with epi epiglottitis, it differs from croup because it's a very sudden onset. So um, croup is kind of like, ah, oh, I had a cold, I don't feel good, a virus, a fever. And then all of a sudden they wake up usually at night, it's usually in the middle of the winter and they have this awful barky cough. Whereas epiglottitis is the kids are pretty okay. And then all of a sudden they spike a really high fever. They have difficulty breathing um, and they develop this croupy, develop strider and this croupy cough. So when they present to us, they usually look a lot sicker than a patient with croup. Um, but we, and, uh, we ask a lot of questions. Are they vaccinated? When did it start? Was it sudden onset? But we give them a racemic epinephrine. And usually with our croup patients, the racemic epinephrine works right away to decrease some of that swelling. Whereas with epiglottitis, it doesn't work. And so that's one of the indicators where it's, okay, well, this racemic epinephrine didn't work. So now we're a little bit more worried about epiglottitis. Um, and so we kind of are hands off. So epiglottitis, because it sticks out so far, we're worried about um, any, we're worried about any interventions because we don't want to um, cause permanent damage or lose their airway. So we're, we walk with, um, we're very, we give antibiotics very quickly. We usually um, try to give uh, antipyretic to get that temperature down, but they have to sedate them and go in and look to see if it's epiglottitis. Because if it's epiglottitis, it is, we are worried about the airway, super worried about the airway and it's antibiotics, 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 and then watch out for them afterwards. Um, but usually, usually we use that um, uh, racemic epinephrine as an indicator of, oh, okay, it worked, we'll probably croup, but it didn't, we're probably going down epiglottitis route. Um, a, a common cardiac issue. So uh, kids, luckily, healthy, healthy hearts, um, but some of the more common cardiac issues that we see are VSDs or ASDs, where it's a hole in the ventricles or a hole in the um, atriums. So these kids usually come in and they're still pink, uh, wait, hold on one second. Would you recommend humidified O2 for epiglottitis? Uh, I would, yes, I would re recommend um, any sort of whatever you have in the back of your truck, um, blow by oxygen for epiglottitis. So if you, if epiglottitis, there's swelling in that airway as well, and anything that will help get air to their lungs and kind of decrease their anxiety of not being able to catch their breath. Um, I, I catch that breath will help them. So am I mistaken or is there systemic epinephrine or no, no for epiglottitis? So um, if, if we know it's epiglottitis, we don't give a racemic epinephrine, but a lot of the times we don't know. And so we use, if we give a racemic epinephrine and it doesn't work, we know that we, we are much more worried about an epiglott epiglottitis and we don't continue to give racemic epinephrine. Um, we can try to get an x-ray. Uh, the An x-ray for epiglottitis will be different than an x-ray for croup, where croup, you see that steeple sign. Um, and epiglottitis, um, it, it's a little bit different. The, the swelling is a little bit, the because the epiglottitis is a little bit more, um, it's, it's, it's protruding more, so it's bigger. Um, but uh, if we know it's, Epiglottitis, no, we do not give racemic epinephrine. But if you're in the back of the truck or in the emergency department, we don't know if it's epiglottitis and we're trying to rule out between croup and epiglottitis, um, then in, uh, one racemic epinephrine would not hurt them that much. Um, any other questions I should have asked before I moved on to the cardiac? Yeah, Allison, this is John. Um, can you just comment, like how often are you seeing epiglottitis? I know the, you know, the common bacteria that cause it are you know, there are vaccines for now. So, I mean, how often are you still seeing the epiglottitis? Very, very rarely. So I can tell you, I can probably count on my hands how many times in my whole entire practice that I've seen epiglottitis. I, um, I, we sometimes rule it out if a patient isn't um, vaccinated or if they're coming in and they look very ill, we worry about epiglottitis but very few children are coming in with epiglottitis these days due to luckily them getting the vaccine um, and us the bacteria not being as prominent.
Any other questions on that? Um, as, as far as cardiac, so we see a lot of VSDs and ASDs, and those are the pink ones that come into us. That means that they're still perfusing, that their heart is still getting oxygen, um, their blood is still getting oxygenated, and their blood is um, perfusing well, and so they're pink. They're coming in um, to us, usually a VSD or an ASD, um, they're not having difficulty breathing, um, but we usually find it because we you know, do an X-ray or um, they get a fever for the first time and if they hear the, the pediatrician will hear the murmur because their heart is beating so fast, it's easier to catch a murmur. Um, but it's, there are so many different cardiac issues. I mean, I, I, if you have one specifically, I can go over. Um, but for cardiac kids, the biggest um, things to remember is to not fluid overload those kids. So they come in, we give them only a small amount of fluids because we don't want to give them too much fluids and have them overloaded and have them um, spill into their lungs and have difficulty breathing because they, um, their heart, their bodies are so small. They have a very little reserve. And so if they're working really hard or if their heart is going so hard, they get tired really quickly. Patients who have a cardiac issue, they are baseline smaller than a normal pediatric patient. They don't, they don't grow as much, they have failure to thrive, they're not absorbing the nutrients the way they're supposed to. And so um, their bodies are working a lot harder anyway. Um, and so they're really, really tired. So with these kids, we worry about giving them too much fluids. We let them sleep as much as possible. Um, and we just make sure that we treat as we go. We, in, in the truck, you want to let them sleep. You, um, it, even in the hospital, we cluster our care so that we're not in and out of the rooms. Um, for the bad cardiac um, patients who come in, um, if they have, you know, tetralogy of flow, or if they uh, have transposition of the great vessels or left, um, any side of left hearted, left sided heart failure, they're, a, little bluer. And so we want to make sure that we're not putting exertion. We're giving them um, small amounts of oxygen as needed. Um, but we also, if they have a, a pulse ox of 90% at home or 86% at home, and the parents are saying that that's normal, you don't want to throw them on a non rebreather You don't want to put them on 100% oxygen 100% of the time because their body can't handle it. So listening to the families and only um, putting, giving them oxygen if they need to, and if you need to give them oxygen, because you know the parents are saying they're supposed to be 90% and they're 70%, make sure you're only giving them small amounts of oxygen to titrate to where they're normally at so that their hearts are not overwhelmed because their bodies aren't used to having that much perfusion at, per, at that one time. So the parents are our greatest, um, are, are the greatest uh, advocates for them. They tell us exactly, you know, what's going on. So we use them a lot as far as how we base their care. Um, but we do, we just, everything in moderation, we go nice and slow with the fluids. We don't want to overload them. If they're having difficulty breathing, we uh, try to get that fluid off very quickly because of their lungs. They work so hard that they're running little marathons inside of their bodies. And we don't want them to get tired and poop out really quick. Um, so it's just a, it's just a we treat their symptoms and it's step by step um, and make sure that we don't fluid overload them. Does that answer your question? Do you want me to go over any other specific cardiac issues? No, thank you. That was wonderful. Oh, no problem. Any other questions? I can go over any other topics. Um, someone just asked if I could talk a little about sepsis and peds. Oh, yes. So pediatric sepsis. Pediatric sepsis is one of the only um, disease processes that we didn't really see a drop off during the pandemic. We have seen um, pediatric sepsis, the same amount of cases of pediatric sepsis throughout the years. It's like been a steady stream. Um, and they a lot of the times we see the beginning of sepsis where they come in and they have a really high temperature, they're tachycardic, 
Um, and so we have a lot of different things in place to monitor for it. So if you have a patient who comes in and we're worried about sepsis due to, you know, maybe they're having poor perfusion, um, maybe their cap rate fills a little slow, they have a really high temperature and they have a really fast heart rate, we'll give that Tylenol and Motrin, but then it's all about fluid resuscitation. We're very quick to put an IV in a patient. We give them 20, um, 20 ml per kilo of normal saline or lactated ringers, or we switch, we can go as high as 40 ml of saline, and then we switch over to um, an epinephrine drip pretty quickly in these kids. A lot of studies have shown that switching over to epinephrine faster than just continuously fluid resuscitating helps, squeeze, helps the heart with the squeeze and they have a better prognosis and they're in the hospital for less time. We're actually right now in Hasbro doing a huge study about um, whether to use resuscitate with lactated ringers versus normal saline, um, just because of when the kids come in and they, they're getting so much fluid over the course of their stay in the hospital that um, we're just looking for what's best. And I know this is common practice, um, but usually pediatrics follows adults. We're always a couple of years behind. Um, we've had some really bad cases of sepsis that have come in over the past five years or so. Um, and they come in and it's usually, it usually starts with something very minor. Like um, we had a patient who came in and she had strep throat or she complained of sore throat. She was fine. I have a sore throat. She came to the ER because it was really hurting her. Um, and then within um, a few hours, um, her perfusion was poor. Her cap refill was delayed. Her blood pressure was in the toilet. It was super low. And in pediatrics, their blood pressure is the last thing to tank on them. Their vital signs will stay normal. Um, their heart rate will go up really high. Their respiratory rate, they'll compensate and compensate. And then they just get tired. They get tired and they're like, hey, I'm done. And their blood pressure starts to drop. Um, and so we see that and we try our, we fluid resuscitate. We start them on pressors, just like you would in an adult. Um, but as their perfusion stop, um, as their perfusion becomes worse, their body starts to shut down. And so, you know, at first they have, um, they, they go into a state of shock where they're not getting the oxygen and the, the, uh, um, the fluid to their fingers and their toes. And so their arms and legs become mottled and, and they're cold. And then all of a sudden it kind of starts creeping up and their kidneys start to fail and they stop, they're not peeing and they're not putting out and it slowly starts to move up. And so they shunt and they shunt to their core, their heart, their, their lungs, their brain. And so that's the only place that's getting the oxygenated blood that they need and everything else starts to shut down. Um, so we make a huge push. We have a lot of things in place where we try to recognize pediatric sepsis very quickly. And sometimes we over, um, we jump very fast and we give a lot of fluids very fast. So we give a bolus of fluids and then we wait. If they still have a high heart rate, even if their fever has now come down, that's an even bigger worrisome um, factor. And so we start them on antibiotics very, usually within that first hour, because it's ideal to start those antibiotics within with that first hour to help improve um, the, their outcomes. And so we start antibiotics and we start fluids and we start pressors. Um, and it is just, uh, we, go up and down and titrate um, the best we can to um, uh, keep their keep their perfusion. Um, and kids are really good where their their organs are so healthy that even if they start shutting down, once you get them perfusing again, they pick back up, their kidneys rebound. Um, so they a lot of patients, pediatric patients who come in with sepsis have a good prognosis as long as we catch it fast um, and treat them with fluids and antibiotics. Does that help? Okay, perfect. Because I can go in more about sepsis. But oh, it helps, perfect. Any other questions? Anything else you want me to go over? Oh, pearls on cardiac arrest. Um, oh, cardiac arrest on pediatric patients is hard. It's hard for everybody. Um, it is hard for EMS in the community. Um, I know that um, uh, they, um, it's, it's airway. 
Most of our patients go into cardiac arrest due to airway problems. We lost the airway, something has happened to the airway. Either they had severe asthma and it caused them to stop breathing because they were holding on to too much CO2 or they were in a trauma or something happened to their airway. They lost their airway and now we lost their cardiac drive. So taking, making sure that when you're um, resuscitating them, that your compressions, quality compressions are key. You want to circulate um, and get make sure that there's good recoil in the heart. And you want to make sure that you're bagging them adequately. Make sure you have a good seal. Make sure that you are um, getting the, that there you have chest rise when you bag them. It, you're, when a, a pediatric patient goes into cardiac arrest, the anxiety hits the roof. It is nerve wracking for everybody around. Everybody just wants this patient somewhere else. Um, but the big things to remember are making sure that you have quality CPR. Um, it just, just trying to do CPR and, and it not, it's, it's just not worth it if you're not, um, if it's not quality. You want to make sure you're getting the oxygen into them. You want to make sure that if you're bagging them, you have that good seal um, and put an IO in. Don't, don't um, hesitate. Put an IO in so that way we can get epinephrine into them. I know that it is sometimes easier or sometimes the setup is right there to try to get an IV in, but trying to get an IV in a patient, especially a pediatric patient who's this little, who has no perfusion due to cardiac arrest is, is damn near impossible. And so go right for the IO, get a dose of epi in and really focus on car compressions, focus on ventilation, um, and then I, I know that in Rhode Island, it, the EMS protocol is on scene for 30 minutes. Um, it, it, that's just hard because if, um, you know, the, the debate is back and forth is if you don't have an earway, we're not going to get this patient back. And we have many stories and I, I of patients who once they were intubated, who were in cardiac arrest, once they were intubated, we got Ross back. But then they had gone so long without a lot of oxygen that they now had, um, that you know, brain damage and anoxic brain injury. Um, so it's just one of those things where I don't know the right answer, but just make sure airway, oxygen, compressions, those are all super important and get them to a facility to get an airway into them. Um, especially if there's, they're a drowning victim and we pull them out, um, they have definitely lost the airway. We, we need to get the airway back. Um, the airway is so much, is, is just as important as the compression. Um, so uh, making sure that you focus on respiratory, focus on breathing um, and compressions. You're welcome. Did you have any qu other questions on cardiac arrest specifically? It's nerve wracking, it's awful. Um, Rhode Island or here, at least at Hasbro, we average uh, one pediatric code per month. Um, so it's, it's not abnormal to have, I, I mean, so it's something that we go over very um, often at Hasbro. We, uh, we have a feedback device um, uh, built into our defibrillator and new um, standards for BLS are that you should have someone giving you feedback when you're giving compressions so that you can give the highest quality compressions at, as possible because high quality compressions are what it, high quality compressions are what's going to get your, your patient back um, and so we um, have someone who is dedicated in the hospital and I know you guys don't have enough room in the back of your truck for this but we have one person that's dedicated to just making sure that the compressions are deep enough and fast enough and that the patients are at that the compressors are allowing for recoil, um, making sure that we're not off the chest for more than 10 seconds at a time, making sure that epinephrine is getting into the patient every, you know, four minutes or, you know, three to five minutes, but it is having a system, talking to each other, knowing that, um, that if you don't have an airway and you're bagging a patient, that you have to stop compressions in order to bag so that the oxygen fully gets into the lungs. Um, and so when it's nerve wracking and your adrenaline's running and you're just doing compressions, it's, it's, it's really hard sometimes to remember to stop 
give the breaths th through the AMBU bag and then start compressions again. Um, so helping as a team member, just reminding, okay, let's stop compressions and, and bag and checking for a pulse, um, making sure that on an infant that you check that brachial pulse and on an adult or a, on a larger kid, you check, you can check a femoral pulse or um, the carotid pulse that you, that you're checking it um, every, excuse me, every two minutes and not just going by the monitor. Most of our codes, they come in in PEA arrest, so the pulseless electrical activity arrest, and so they'll have movement on the monitor. They have healthy hearts. They want to keep beating. They didn't want to stop, and so they have these healthy hearts, and so um, it, it's very common for us to have that electricity, um, not organized, but this electricity on the monitor, um, So you have it, but nothing takes away from actually assessing your patient and checking for a pulse um, just because of how often and patients come to us and they're in a PEA arrest and they have a rhythm on the monitor, but no pulse. Any other questions? Well, thank you. Thank you for letting me come and talk about pediatrics here. Yeah, Allison, thanks very much. We really appreciate it. And I know I've seen a lot of the comments. It was very well received. And I, and I certainly thank you very much for, um, uh, for participating in rounds. Um, we will, um, we'll do rounds again next month and we'll have a, Kate, we'll have a, uh, a topic uh, uh, soon to, to um, advertise. And I'm still working on the, the Con Ed credits for, uh, for Rhode Islanders. Um, I have to go through train and it's, um, you know, if you've dealt with the state, you know what that's all about. So anyway, still working on that. Um, so stand by for that. And again, thank you all for participating. Thanks for joining on. And Allison, thank you uh, once again. No problem. Thank you, Allison. Great presentation. Oh, no problem. And if anybody ever has uh, questions about a case they bring in, you guys can email me and we can set up a, a way to go over or if you have any questions, um, we can go over things and, and you can always ask me questions. Great. Thanks for, thanks for that offer. That's always helpful to get feedback on, on cases.